Amen. Well, welcome everybody. I want to just welcome those who are watching online, again to those in the house. We've been in a sermon series called Simon Says. Um, it's been seven weeks so far. Today is going to be the eighth and final message as we've been studying the sayings of Simon Peter and the Gospels. We've been looking at these sayings, and just like the game Simon Says, we've been looking at the ones we should follow and the ones we should avoid. And so today, um, we're going to actually look at Simon's lowest moment in the Scripture. This would be the rock bottom moment for Simon Peter, and thankfully it was the rock bottom, and he was able to bounce back from this, but this is a very low and tragic moment uh, of Simon in the scripture, all right? So today's message is called, Simon Says Bleep. That really resonated with some of y'all. I can feel that. That really, I, I knew some of y'all were like, Simon is my dude, right? Because some of y'all even last week during the Colts' pitiful performance was doing the exact thing that Simon does in this portion of scripture. I was watching football, actually, not a Colts game, but I was watching football uh, with some people from the church, and we were watching, and uh, one of the players fumbled, and this person yelled out, oh, bleep. And then she looked at me, and she was like, oh, no, I'm at the pastor's house. <laughs> I mean, you guys know, like, when you say anything bad around the pastor, you got to explain. Yourself. I mean, I'm sorry. I mean, please, I mean, forget you. And that's how it was. Well, uh, let me give you the background of Simon cursing, and I'm going to actually explain it a little bit more. It was more than just saying a bad word. Um, there's a lot more to it, but let me give you just the context of what was happening right here. So Jesus has been captured by the Jewish um, Sanhedrin, which is kind of their high council uh, of guards, and they bring in um, Jesus and put him on trial. All right, and Simon Peter sees this. The, the disciples scattered at this point. They're kind of concerned about what was happening. And so then they uh, follow Jesus. Peter does, uh, and I think John does too. But it says that, that Simon kind of followed him at a distance. He gets there to where the Sanhedrin were putting Jesus on counsel and, and on trial. And this is where the scripture picks up in Matthew 26, verses 69 through 75. Now, Peter sat outside in the courtyard. And a servant girl came to him saying, you also were with Jesus of Galilee. But he, Peter, denied it before them all saying, I do not know what you are saying. When he had gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and said those, to those who were there, this fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But again, Peter denied with an oath, I do not know the man. And a little later, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, Surely you also are one of them, for your speech betrays you. And then in verse 74, he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. And immediately a rooster crowed. Let me just explain real quick before I read that last verse what this means when it says that he cursed and began to swear. This wasn't just saying bad words. He was actually saying this. If I know Jesus... If I'm not telling you the truth right now, then may a curse be upon my head. That, that's how cursing worked in the Old Testament. And even now, if you tell somebody, you know, to go to hell or something like that, that'd be a really terrible curse you're trying to put on somebody. Well, in this scenario, he is literally saying, curse be me if I actually know this man, Jesus. And then the rooster crowed, which then brought to him the words of Jesus, verse 75, said, Peter, remember the words of Jesus who had said to him before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And look what he does. So he went out and wept bitterly. It doesn't just say he cried. Notice this. It says that he wept bitterly. He, he was so ashamed and so frustrated, so mad, so, so, so upset that he just denied Jesus even after Jesus gave him the warning. And not only did he deny him, he said, a curse be me if I actually know him. The lowest moment of Peter's life, a moment of great regret and shame. And there are things that led up to this moment. As we've been talking about the whole time, we've been learning from Peter's example, good and bad. There were some things that led him to this state of backsliding, if you will, to this degree. There, there was some things that led him to this dark point 
in his life. And those things we can learn from because I believe they're leading some of us to great weeping and great bitterness in our heart and great backsliding in our life. So let's look at three things that led Peter to this point and let us learn from it, all right? Let's learn from these things that led him to this place of denial of Jesus and cursing even upon himself. All right, here's the first thing. A boastful self-reliance. A boastful self-reliance. We're gonna kind of reverse engineer this message by going back into this story. The same night that all this happened, the things that led Peter down this path. And the first thing that I wanna go to is actually where Jesus warns Peter and the rest of the disciples that they're gonna scatter and they're gonna be offended because of him that night. And this is where I want to pick up in Matthew 26 so we learn of his boastful self-reliance. Matthew 26, earlier in the chapter than what we read, verses 31 to 35 say this. Then Jesus said to them, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. So he's warning them that they're going to actually all leave him because he's going to be hit. He's going to actually be going to the cross. But verse 32, after I've raised, I will go before you in Galilee. And look what Peter says. Peter answered and said to him, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. I want you to catch this boastful self-reliance. Verse 34, Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you that this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Jesus actually warns him of this. And what does Peter do? Does Peter in humility and fear and and actual like some some gravity, does he say, oh no, Jesus, how, how can I prevent this? How can you help me in this? No, what does he say? Verse 35, Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. Now this seems to be like a, a great statement of, of faith and devotion to Jesus, but I want you to think this was all so, so self-reliant. He was so self-assured in his own devotion, in his own faithfulness, in his own love to Jesus that he says, there's nothing that anybody could do to make me deny you, to make me be offended of you. Now, I think that this is such an important thing for us to check our own heart in because the moment you think you stand, the Bible says, beware lest you fall. The moment you think you're good is the moment you need to reconsider everything in your life. The moment that you think that you're standing and you're cool and nothing's going to shake you from your faith is the moment you need to get on your knees and call out to God because you're one more step away from something stupid. Come on, do I got a witness in the house, right? What Peter needed to realize is that his devotion wasn't the answer to never fall away from Jesus. That his own faithfulness, his own love, his own goodness, his own self-reliance, his own power, his own willpower was not enough to stay close to Jesus. The only thing that was going to cause Peter to stand is the same thing that causes you and I to stand. Nothing but the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not our own self-reliance, not our own goodness, not our own power, not our own devotion, Peter should have already learned this along the way, that his devotion wasn't good enough. His own wisdom, his own knowledge, his own love for the Lord wasn't good enough for him to stand and stay standing. We've learned in seven prior messages of him getting it wrong pretty much most of the time, of him falling short, even in great moments of success. The moment later, just in the same chapter, you see him falling back into his own ways. So what do we rely on as Christians? We rely on the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. We humble ourselves every single day knowing that I can fall in just a moment of time. When you read stories like this, y'all, when you see uh, men of God, women of God, maybe even in our culture fall, maybe it's a, a, a great pastor maybe it's a great you know mega church pastor, TV evangelist or whatever. In those moments, do you sit back and judge and think, this will never happen to me? Do you even say something like, I would never do something like that? Or do you let these moments, even Peter's falling in this moment, allow you to consider your own waywardness, 
your own sinfulness, your own propensity to kind of go off the path in the will of God? Do you consider it that way? Do you humble yourself in that way? Or do you actually stand thinking in judgment, how could they do that? I would never do that myself. I got to let everybody know this. And this is in years of following Jesus. I've been that way in my life where I've looked at my own goodness and devotion and said I could never do some of the worst of the worst. But I've realized in those moments, I was just one more step away from a fall that I ended up falling myself. And so in these moments, when I see Peter falling in the scripture, when I see David falling in the scripture, when I hear about Ravi Zacharias and what he did recently in our own culture and what was exposed about him, what I do now is consider my own heart. I consider myself in the matter and I say by the grace of God, This, if it could happen to Peter, if it could happen to David, if it could happen to Ravi, it could happen to me. This is a warning. Jesus actually throws out this warning. He tells them all they're going to be scattered. And does that warning cause Peter to consider himself? No, he's just standing in self-reliance. And his own devotion and his own pride and his own boastfulness saying, I will never deny you. Can I tell you, this is not how we're to respond to a warning in our life. It's not how we're to respond in these scriptures. I quoted this here just a, a moment ago in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, where it says, those who think they stand, beware lest they fall. The context of that scripture is Paul is writing about the Israelites and all of their stupidity in the wilderness. Come on, when we read that, do we think, man, that's crazy, right? But he says, if this happens to them, this is actually written for our warning so that we would consider ourselves, so that we would recognize if it could happen to them, it could happen to us. And so he says, therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. All of us are one step away from stupid. Every husband is one step away from adultery. Every wife is one step away from adultery. Every one of us is one step away from denying the Lord in our actions, maybe even denying him with our lips. All of us in our own sinfulness, are capable of the worst of the worst things. So when we hear warnings like this, when we see these things in the scripture, they're for our admonishment, they're for us to be warned that if it could happen to them, it could happen to us. I'm talking about backsliding in this message. When I've seen people backslide, maybe it's back into drug addiction. Can I tell you, this is the first step of them going and using drugs again? I got it. I beat it. I've been free for three years. Look at me. I'm not even interested in drugs anymore. Those who think they stand, beware lest they fall. This is one step to backsliding that you clearly see is Peter's heart in this matter. And can I let everybody also know this? Beware of saying um, inner vows. We talk about this in Encounter. And so, fellas, if you want to learn more about this, come to Encounter. But when you think, like, maybe you're saying things like, uh, your dad was a drunk, and you said, I'll never be a drunk. My dad was, I'll never be abusive. My, My dad never treated my mom with good. I'll never do that. Be careful in those inner vows. Why? You're relying on your own strength in those moments. I'll never do this. You know the quickest way for you to learn a lesson? Stand in pride and watch God show you what you said you would never do. That's what Peter had to learn here. Clearly, I'll never deny you. Watch this, Jesus said. Watch this. Before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. 
All right, so be careful of your own boastful self-reliance. That's one way that you get to this place of deep regret as Peter got. All right, let's look at the second thing I want us to learn. How, how, what is the other thing that led Peter to this low point? Another thing is a complacency in prayer. A complacency in prayer. Again, let's go back to the story. After Jesus is having that last supper, after he warned all of them that they're going to be scattered, he then goes into the Garden of Gethsemane. And he begins to pray, and he takes in his closest, Peter, James, and John, to pray with him. And this is where we pick up in Matthew 26, 37 through 41. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, and he began to be sorrowful. This is Jesus talking and deeply distressed. He knows what's coming. He knows the cross is coming. Verse 38, then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here. And watch with me, he says. That's another word to kind of like pray at night. Watch. He went a little further, fell on his face, Jesus did, and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Look at verse 40. Then he came to the disciples. What does he find them doing in this evening? In his greatest time of need, in his greatest time of distress, his greatest friends, his closest friends, are not watching with him as he asked them to do. What are they doing? Sleeping. He came to the disciples, found them sleeping, and said to Peter, what? Notice it says what with with an exclamation point. Think about Jesus' emotion here. Think about what he's saying to Peter, even knowing that Peter's about to go and deny him. He already sees kind of the head. He says, What? (laughs) Could you not watch with me one hour? And it's not a matter of even the time here. He's just saying, couldn't you just be with me in this moment? Couldn't you just pray with me in this moment? Verse 41, he says, watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He's giving this warning to Peter, like if you want to stay strong in the Lord and the power of his might, if you really want to walk in such a way that you're not going to deny me, you know what you need to do? You need to pray. You need to watch. Peter needed to realize some things in this moment. He doesn't, he doesn't know what's about to come. Well, he should have because Jesus warned them all. But he just ate this big meal 